morning, Sardis. It's good morning. to see you all this morning. It's good to see Miss Jackson here today. She hasn't been out here recently. So we welcome you all to the service this morning. I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing maybe a song we're not used to singing at Christmas. It's called Thou Didst Leave Thy Throne. But worship with us as we sing our opening song. Good morning, Sardis Baptist Church. It is good to see everyone here today. And if you are a visitor with us, we especially welcome you into our service. And we are thankful to the Lord that he brought you to us this morning. And you are a special guest, and we, uh, we do appreciate uh, you being here. And we want to recognize your presence with us in the way we do that here. We don't want to embarrass you or put you on the spot. But as you were walking in, I hope you received a bulletin. And inside that bulletin, you will find a little tear-off that just uh, has some information that you can jot down about yourself. As I say every week, uh, I promise that if you give us that information, we will not blow up your email and we will not uh, come visit unannounced. And so uh, we just want to record your presence with us. So if you'd fill that out and on your way out the door, you'll see some offering plates if you'll drop that form into the offering plate at that time. The only offering we asked our guests to make is that of yourself and letting us know that you were here. Or if you would like a visit, I would love to come and visit with you and sit down and talk to you. And if you would uh, like that, then instead of putting that form into the offering plate, just hand it to me at the end of the service and we'll set up a time at your convenience to come by and visit with you. I would indeed consider that an honor. And so we welcome you here today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessings upon our time together this morning. Our Father, we do thank you again for the grace, God, that you've extended to us in allowing us to be here this morning. Father, we know that what we have come to do this morning has eternal significance. Father, as we gather as your people, as your church, Father, to lift up our praises uh, to you, Father, to sit under the preaching in the teaching of your word. And God, I do pray today that you would uh, move amongst these uh, people here in our congregation. Father, that you would bring 
uh, conviction where conviction is needed. Father, that you would bring uh, encouragement where that is needed. But Father, of all things, we pray. And above all things, Father, we ask you to make much of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in this service. For he is the reason, Father, that we are here. Father, we thank you, uh, God, for who you are. We thank you for the grace and the mercy that you uh, shed abroad in our lives. Father, grace that is undeserved, but Father, grace that is received. And I pray that we would receive it with a humble heart. And Father, we pray today, if there be one here today who's never received Christ, that Father, that they walked into this church building, Father, lost and undone and eternally separated from you, God, we do pray that you would open their eyes today. Father, that you would give them ears to hear. Father, that you would give them a heart of flesh, Father, and that you would bring conviction of their need uh, for Jesus Christ, for a Savior, Father, and they would submit their lives to you today. Father, we ask you to do that because you're the only one who can do that. And so, God, we trust uh, you in all things. So bless our time. Bless this service, Father, and we'll give you the glory and the praise afford all for you are worthy and to be praised and we ask this in the name of Jesus amen for the many thousand years between the fall Genesis and the the first part of the New Testament there were prophets who foretold that the Lord would come to save us so we sing today, come thou long expected Jesus, but we know that he did come to save us. So join with us if you would like, the words will be on the screen, but worship with us as we sing, come thou long expected Jesus. have your copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to be making your way to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 
3. It is right if you're new to Bible study, it is the first book of your Bible. It'll be about three or four pages <clears throat> in. And we're going to focus this morning our attention on one verse of Scripture, which will be chapter 3, verse 15. But I want to read from verse 8 down to verse 21 to kind of give you some context. And so uh, let's, let's, uh, let's see what the Word of God says. G- Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. And at this point, just so you know, this point in the, in the text, uh, the serpent has come, he has deceived Eve, the sin has entered, and now God is proclaiming some things at this point after, after the deception. Pick it up in verse 8. Of Genesis chapter 3, and it says, And they, talking about Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, and he said to him, Where are you? Now just so you know, God's not asking that question for information, right? He's not... He's very much aware of where they are. He's asking questions for the sake of Adam and Eve. But he says, where are you? And he said, this is Adam, he said, well, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? So we get from that that there was a time when Adam and Eve could walk around with no shame. But now all of a sudden they notice uh, the shame. And God asked them a very profound question. Well, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, here's the great passing the buck right here. And the man said, the woman you gave to me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. And then the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? She's going to pass the buck as well. The woman said, well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. In verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And Here's our key verse. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise or crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. And to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for or against your husband. And he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife... And have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you. You shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust. And to dust you shall return. Verse 20, And the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for this time that we can spend together. Lord, and I do pray, God, that you would use your word this morning. Father, for the purpose for which you've intended it. God, that it would go out and it would not return to you void. Lord, and I pray today that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be found acceptable in your sight. For it's in my rock and my redeemer, I pray. In Jesus' blessed name, amen. You know, as we come here to this third chapter in the book of Genesis, we need to approach uh, this chapter with some understanding. And the understanding is this, is that this chapter explains all the ills that we have in this world. 
If you were here last week, you heard me speak about the great confusion and the turmoil that we see out in the world today. And that this great confusion and turmoil has always existed. And what we need to understand is that Genesis chapter 3 is the source of all that confusion and all that turmoil. You see, Genesis chapter 3 is the chapter where God tells us how the world became undone. How it fell into sin. And how paradise was lost. It is here that we find the reason for wars and conflicts. It is here that we find the reason for all the disease and all the sickness. And yes, even the pandemics. They have their source here in Genesis chapter 3. Here in this chapter we find the beginnings of every trial of every cancer, of every temptation and every death and everything that has ever tormented us in this world, we find its beginnings right here in Genesis chapter 3. You see, it's in this story that we find all the lies and the lust and the evils that inflict humanity. See, here in this chapter is the beginning of every proud and arrogant spirit. Every murder, every rape, every genocide finds its source in Genesis chapter 3. It is here we find the reason man distorts God's beautiful design for marriage and human sexuality. It is in this chapter where we see the beginnings of every case of child abuse and every murder of every baby in their mother's womb. It finds its source here in Genesis chapter 3. You see, friends, it is here that we find the beginning of the sorry and sinful course of mankind. And here's the reality for us. This is the only reality we've ever known. This is all we've ever known. And so why I believe so many take sin, or don't take sin very seriously at all, because it's all that they've ever known. No. This is why it's easy for us to justify things. It's easy for us to rationalize our sin, and it's easy for us to look to other people and compare ourselves to other people who may sin worse than we do or who may sin differently than we do. Because it's all we've ever known. It is the totality of our existence. However, God shows us here in this chapter The seriousness to which He takes sin. And He has laid out for us here in His Word the consequences of our unrighteousness and of our rebellion. He's also shown us what that unfaithfulness and what that rebellion has cost us. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, we find this beautiful story of God's creation. And God's creation, and He said, after He created, He looked back on all that He created, and He said, it's very good. It was a beautiful creation, and of that creation, the crown jewel of that creation was man, when He created Adam. See, the Scriptures tell us that God supplied everything in order that our universe might exist. He created something out of nothing, and He spoke Everything into existence. He made the moon and the stars to govern the night. He made the sun to heat and light the day. He created the animals of the sea and those walking upon the earth. He made flowers to bloom and He made plants to grow. And then from the dust of the ground, He created man. And He breathed the breath of life into man. And that man became a living soul. And Adam, Adam was the crown jewel of creation. And because Adam was the only creature that was created in the image of his creator, he was the crown jewel. And so God created this perfect place called Eden. And he placed Adam in that garden. He placed him in there to rule it and to enjoy it and to work it and to enjoy the perfect presence of God. 
as he enjoyed fellowship with his creator. And then God saw that Adam had no suitable helpmate for him, so God creates the woman from the side of man to be the perfect helpmate for Adam. And God created them, hear me, male and female. That is God's perfect and eternal and unchanging design, regardless of what culture may tell you. He created them male and female. God placed Adam and Eve in the garden. And the garden was free of any defects. It was perfect. It was the place that our first parents had freedom to live and to work and to enjoy God's presence every day. And their task God had given them. Their task was to go and be fruitful and multiply and to expand the boundaries of Eden. And that's what he told them to do. And this was the arrangement that was made between God and man. And this arrangement is known as a covenant. Theologians call this first covenant between God and Adam, they call it either the covenant of works or the covenant of creation. Now that may be new language to some of you, so let me explain what it means. A covenant is nothing more than an agreement. An agreement between two parties. In this case, the two parties are God and Adam, or the Creator and the creature. And in this covenant, there are promises made. There are stipulations that must be adhered to. And there are consequences if that covenant was not honored. And so in this covenant, God gave our first parents enormous responsibilities. And He gave them freedom and latitude to carry out the tasks for which He had created them. And what he had told them to go do. And so Adam and Eve were made in God's image to rule the world as servants and as sons and daughters. And not only that, but to rule as what and function what we call as a a king priest. They were given the task to mediate God's blessing to the world as king and queen of God's creation. That's a pretty good gig, isn't it? That's not bad. That was their task. And this task was to take place in a perfect environment with a perfect relationship with their Creator. However, this rule was not exercised autonomously. God is still on His throne. God still controls all things. And there was one stipulation that they had. They had total freedom to do anything. They had the garden and everything in it. There was one stipulation that they had, and that stipulation was this. They were not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were not to touch it. Because if they did, God said, you will surely die. That's the only rule they had. One rule. One law. Can you imagine? Can you imagine living life and you only got one thing, one law, and one rule to obey? Man, I can't even get my mind around that. We have rules all over the place. We're tripping over rules. We're tripping over laws. You can't swing a cat over your head without hitting a rule somewhere. And I'm just talking about the Sardis bylaws. I'm not even talking about stuff out in the world. Please send all your emails to Lee Adams at Fabertech. <laughs> but they had one rule to obey, and that was not to touch the tree. Now, here's what we need to understand about that stipulation. God did not put that rule there to trick them or to try to trip them up. God didn't take the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't take that tree and tuck it somewhere in the backside of the garden in hopes that they would stumble upon it. No, He put the tree in the middle of the garden. He told them where it was, what it was, and what would happen if they ate of it. And so the standard for them was perfect obedience. And that obedience was consisted of not eating from that tree. That was it. And so the covenantal requirements were clearly set forth and the penalty for disobedience was clearly stated and that penalty was death. Not just physical death, but spiritual death. And so here's the situation that we find Coming into Genesis 3. Fulfill the covenant 
Obey God and live in perfect peace and in perfect relationship with Him for all eternity. Disobey and break the covenant and you will be banished from the garden and from God's presence. And then you'll die both spiritually and physically. And sadly, as Paul Harvey used to say, we know the rest of the story, don't we? We know the rest of the story. We know that the covenant was broken. Paradise was lost. God says in Hosea 6, 7 that Adam transgressed the covenant. And so paradise was lost. And so how did this happen? Well, when we come to Genesis chapter 3, we find a new character coming up on the scene. We've seen God, we've seen Adam, and we've seen Eve. And now we see someone else coming on to the story. And in Genesis chapter 3, we find the great deceiver coming on the scene. And he deceives the woman. And she gives to her husband. And thus dragging mankind into sin. And under a curse. And so why did it happen? Why did the serpent do this? Well, if you know anything about the serpent, we know that he was Lucifer. Some translations call him the morning star. He was an angel at one time. Not just any angel. He was God's greatest angel. Beautiful angel. But you see, Lucifer wasn't content with being the best angel of God. Lucifer wanted to be God. He wanted to be God. All the glory and all the praise that God was receiving he wanted all that for himself and in his pride and in his arrogance he tried to remove God from his throne if you can imagine that he started a rebellion in heaven but instead of removing God from his throne God cast him out of heaven and Lucifer was cast down and so was a third of all the angels And as he was cast down, he became Satan, and the angels became demons. But here's the reality for us. The ambition of Lucifer, now Satan, hadn't changed at all. It's still there. Now his ambition is to do as much damage as he can. To do as much damage as he can, Satan determined that if he couldn't remove God from his throne, then he was going to destroy that which meant the most to God, and that was man. The crown jewel of his creation. I love what the great reformer John Calvin said. He said this. And because he, talking about Satan, could not drag God from his throne, he assailed man in whom God's image shone. He knew that with the ruin of man, the most dreadful confusion would be produced in the whole world. And indeed, it happened. And therefore, he endeavored that Satan... He endeavored in the person of man, and here's the key, to obscure the glory of God. That's his purpose. That's his ambition. And this is the devil's one and only scheme. He has nothing new. From the beginning until now, this is his ambition to do that, to obscure the glory of God in all that he does by attacking man. You see, you and I, We're created to display God's glory in this world. The Westminster Confession of Faith, question number one, asks this question. What is the chief end of man? And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That is our purpose. That is why we're here. That is why we were created. Was to glorify God or to display God's glory. We were created in His image. And here's the thing. If Satan could mar that image then it distorts God's glory in us. And so you see what his game plan is. He can't remove him from his throne. So he wants to dishonor him by attacking man and marring the glory of God that we are supposed to display. You see, the purpose of salvation, friends, listen to me and listen carefully. The purpose of salvation is not just to keep you out of hell. No, the purpose of salvation is to return you And to return me to what we were supposed to be. And that is 
to display the glory of our Creator. You see, the Holy Spirit saves us and He sanctifies us so that we might display the glory of God. You see, our salvation is first and foremost about God's glory. That is why it has to be a work of God from beginning to end. Because it's God's glory that's at stake. And Satan's attack upon us is not so much about us as much as it is about him attacking God. His ambition has not stopped. And this is why sin is such a serious thing. And why God takes it so seriously. And why you and I, as image bearers of our Creator, should take it seriously as well. And so here Satan comes to the garden and he deceives Eve and she takes of the tree and drags all humanity into sin. And now what is God to do? God is, if I can use this language, God is forced now to honor His Word and what He said would happen. God said if you take of it, you'll die. And so sin has entered the whole world. The covenant is broken. And the curse now is pronounced. Right? And the passage that we read here in Genesis chapter 3 describes the curse that God pronounced on mankind. First, God cursed Eve. He cursed Eve with pain and childbirth. And all God's ladies said, Amen, right? Yeah. So when you see a woman in labor and she's hurting, Folks, that's the curse being displayed. And then it says that her desire would be to rule over her husband. All right, hang on. Her desire would be to rule over her husband. You see, here's the reality that I think we miss. God created a perfect order. He created a design. He created man and a helpmate. And she was the suitable helpmate for him. God's design was perfect. Male headship. And the woman was his helpmate. But yet, because of the curse, that design has been distorted. That design has been wrecked. And that's why we see so many marriages in trouble. That's why we see men who want to dominate over women instead of loving their wives as we're told to in Ephesians 5. It says, Husbands, to love your wives as Christ loved the church... And gave himself for her. That is a sacrificial kind of love. See, male headship has nothing to do with dominating. It is about sacrificing. But yet, part of the curse for Eve and for women is that they will now want to rule over their husband. The, the, the design becomes distorted. You want to know what militant feminism is all about? Friends, here it is. It's part of the curse. It's the curse being lived out. And so God cursed Eve. And He also cursed Adam. He cursed Adam for listening to his wife and eating from the tree. And He cursed Adam with hard labor and trying to grind out a living. And isn't it hard? I tell people that's why they call it work, right? Because it's difficult. It's hard and grueling to grind out a living with all of its stress. And all of its backbreaking work. And man, he says, will return to the ground from which he came. And they died a spiritual death at the moment of sinning. And they were banished from the garden and from the presence of God. And then they awaited the final part of their judgment. And that is the physical death that they would experience later on in their life. So we see the curse that was pronounced. And I know what some of you are thinking because I can see... It on your face is, Michael, what in the world does that have to do with Christmas? Right? I mean, we got all these beautiful decorations up. We, we even got a series called The Word Became Flesh. We're talking about Christmas. What in the world does Genesis 3 have to do with Christmas? Well, I am glad you asked. God not only cursed the man... And God not only cursed the woman, but He also cursed the serpent. He also cursed Satan. And what I want you to see is that the beauty of Christmas 
is seen in the curse of Satan that we find in verse 15. Let's, let's read it again. God says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. We find in that curse uh, great hope. You see, here in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 3, a mere three chapters into your Bible, we find the first mention of the gospel here in Genesis chapter 3. We find the first mention of the gospel and the great hope for mankind. I love what the great Puritan pastor, a man by the name of Thomas Manton, he said this. He's, he's talking about verse 15. He said, these words are part of the gospel that was preached in paradise. Can you imagine that? The gospel, the good news was preached in paradise. He said these words were part of the gospel preached in paradise or the first promise of grace and life made to mankind now fallen and dead in sin. As God was cursing the serpent, He draws out this comfort to our first parents who were confounded with the sense of sin and their defection from God. See, Satan's condemnation is our salvation. Let me say that again. Satan's condemnation is our salvation. He did the first mischief, talking about Satan. Therefore, the crushing of his head gives hope of our deliverance out of this state of misery into which he has plunged us. End quote. There's great hope for us. In verse 15. And I want you to notice real quick the great promise that we see in this text. God pronounces the curse on the serpent and He says this. That He will put enmity between the serpent and the woman. And between her offspring and His offspring. Now that word enmity simply means this. Hostility. It means conflict. It means ill will on one side or on both sides. It means hatred. Or mutual antagonism. And so here's what we know about this hostility, this enmity, this conflict. Here's what we know about it between the woman and the serpent. We know this hostility is good. It's good for us. It is good because it is God who put it there. God said, I will put enmity between the woman and the serpent, between her offspring and his. God said He would put it there. Therefore, we know because God is good. And all that God does is good. And we know this hostility and this conflict is also good. Notice also that this text is moving from kind of general to more specific. This hostility is not only between the serpent and the woman, but it's also between her offspring and his. Now, what I want you to see here is that this hostility exists between the people of God that is represented by the woman and the people of the world that is represented by the serpent. You see, what we need to understand very clearly is that these two types of people exist. And I want you to hear me on this. Every human being was created in the image of God. But every human being is not a child of God. Only God's children, those who are saved, those are the children of God. Those who are not are children of their father, the devil, as the text tells us. You see, these two types of people exist. And they're mentioned all throughout Scripture. You can begin reading in Genesis chapter 4 and work your way all the way to the book of Genesis and you'll see these two types of people who exist, those that are God's children and those who are not. And this divinely brought animosity or hostility, this is for our good. And God uses this hostility to sharpen our wills and to serve Him and to make us more sensitive to sin. That's why it's there. But I want you to notice something. I want you to notice the subtle but glorious change in the language in that text. Notice that we go from a general mention of the woman's offspring to one specific person. You see that at the end of that verse. The text says, he, he, one person, 
He will bruise or crush. That first word bruise there, it's a, the verb tense is more severe than the second. It means lethal. He will bruise or crush your head. And he's talking about Satan. And you, talking about Satan, will bruise his. Talking about that one special person. You will bruise his heel. In other words, this one person is going to give the serpent a lethal blow. And the serpent will give him a striking blow. And then from verse 15, this glorious verse, from verse 15, it launches us out into this wonderful discovery in the rest of the Old Testament. As you read through the rest of the Old Testament, the rest of the Old Testament deals with trying to learn and figure out who this man is. Who is this one who's going to crush the head of the serpent? Who is this one person who's going to undo all the evil that has been done? Who is he? Of course, like I said last week, we have the benefit of being on this side of the cross, right? We're new covenant people. So we know very well who that one is. And that is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, and here is the beauty of Christmas that we find in the curse that God applied so long ago. You see, the good enmity and the hostility that God placed between the woman and Satan and her offspring and his that hostility, folks, gives us hope for today. The hostility tells us that God has not abandoned us. That He has established a, this beneficial enmity between those who desire good and those who desire evil. We feel the hostility. Friend, listen to me. If you feel the struggle, if you look out into this world and you just don't understand what in the world people are doing, folks rejoice in that because that means your spirit is alive. It means God has done something in your life. He has awakened you to sin and depravity and you see it. And you don't understand because there's this hostility that God put between us who belong to God and the world. And so folks, if you feel it, if you see it, Rejoice, rejoice that God has done something in your life. This is why many of us look out into this world and God and we see what's happening. We just can't believe it. You think to yourself, how can anyone think like that or do that? This is why when the world looks at us or somebody like me and they just cannot understand why I don't believe a, a boy can become a girl or a girl can become a boy. I say, how do you not believe that? Because God had a design. He had a perfect design. And our gender is a gift from God. It is why when the world looks at us, and they don't understand why we believe that little clump of cells in that mother's womb is a life. And they don't understand why we don't think it's okay to kill it. Because they don't understand. And so there's this tension that we live in. And if you feel it, and if you see it, dear friend, rejoice. Rejoice in that. That means God has done a work in your life. You see, and this is what we saw last week in Isaiah uh, chapter 9 and verse 6. We said that God is most definitely for us. He's for us. He's not only with us as Emmanuel, but He is for us. And however, the greatest of the enmities... Between this special one of the woman and Satan, this greatest of enmities assures us of not only hope in the here and now, but it also assures us of our complete and total victory that was won for us. You see, when Jesus Christ was born, when He came, He took the greatest descent from glory that had ever been taken. And He came to this earth and He was born of a woman, born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, fulfilled all the law and the prophets, and he died on the cross, a substitutionary death for the sins of his people, and he was gloriously raised and resurrected on the third day, thus fulfilling everything that God said would happen. And in that moment, Jesus Christ, the one of the woman, crushed the head of the serpent, and victory was sure. And complete for all who will believe. You see where Adam, the first Adam failed. The second Adam 
succeeded. And this is our present reality. And this is our greatest hope for today. And like I said last week, our bright hope for tomorrow. Make no mistake about it. The war has been won for us. Victory is sure. Now there may be some more battles we're going to have to face as we walk through this life. And as we walk in this world, no doubt. But make no mistake about it. Your victory, if you're in Christ, is sure. And it's been won. And it is complete. And all of this was accomplished for us. Why? Because a child was born. And because a son was given. You know, and here's the thing I love about Christmas. Christmas is always full of surprises, isn't it? Don't we just love that? See all the tree, uh, the gifts under the tree and we just get surprised this time of year. But who but God could supply the greatest surprise of all and that is including our victory in the curse of our greatest enemy. Only God can do that. What a gloriously and gracious and merciful God that we have. That He would do that for us. And what better reason do we have as we come to this time of year to celebrate Christmas? Because the curse has been reversed and the victory has been won. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? We come to a moment of, of invitation. And friends, like I say every week, if you are here today and you're outside of Christ, if you've never surrendered your life to Christ and all of those promises that we talked about are not yours. The Bible says that you are still under the curse. The Bible says that the wrath of God abides on you. And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Friend, you may have walked in here this morning undone. But you don't have to leave that way. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Will be saved. So if that's you today, right where you're sitting, I encourage you right now to cry out to God. There's no magic words. There's no special prayer. You're just asking God to forgive you. You're asking Him to forgive you of your sins. You're submitting your life to Him from this day forward. You're humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God and you're asking Him to forgive you and receive the free gift of grace that He offers to everyone in Christ. If that is you this morning. Cry out to God. I beg you. You don't have to leave this building the way you came in. Your whole life and all of eternity can change in just a moment. If that's you, we're going to ask you to come in just a moment and take Rich or some or me by the hand and we'd love to talk to you about that decision. If you're here today and you're a believer and you've never been baptized, the Bible says that is your first act of obedience. We invite you to come as well. Maybe you're here today and you're in need of a church home. The doors of this church are open and we invite you to come and we'd love to talk to you about what it means to be part of this congregation. In just a moment, you come as well. But for all of us who are in Christ and all of us who are believers, dear friends, let us rejoice this Christmas season. Like I said, the curse is reversed. Our victory is sure. And this is why we celebrate Christmas. And Father, again, we thank you we thank you for your goodness and your grace in our life, God. We thank you for your word. And God, we thank you for the greatest surprise of all, that you included our victory in the curse of our greatest enemy. God, we rejoice and we pray today that you would help us to live out our lives and put on display to everyone your glory. Father, forgive us where we fail you. Help us to live the kind of life you would have us to live. Father, I pray today for the one who may be here 
who's struggling right now, who's never received Christ, Father, I pray that you would bring deep conviction. Father, not give them a moment's rest until their salvation is settled. So, Father, we ask you to have your way and will through this invitation. And we'll give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You stand. Thank you, Barbara. You may be seated. Uh, at this time, before we begin with uh, uh, our business meeting, we want to just give you a few closing announcements before we dismiss for today. We'd like to remind everyone that the Children's Christmas Program will be here tonight in the sanctuary at 6 p.m., and they would love to have you join them for that for the fum, uh, Fumbly Bumbly Angels is the name of the production, 6 p.m. tonight. Uh, we would greatly appreciate the help of a few uh, strong men before the uh, they leave today to move the podium and uh, some of the items that are up here in preparation for the musical tonight. Uh, also, we are going to be having our adult Christmas program on December 20th at 6 p.m. That's also another Sunday night, just here in a few short weeks. Uh, many of you remember that we participated in wreaths across America, and we are, the wreaths have arrived, and we are looking for some help to put those out among the uh, graves of um, the cemetery for our veterans, and so please talk to Snip White about that. He'd love some help with that. And uh, lastly, we are going to transition into our business meeting uh, with uh, Lee Adams and Richard, oh, there. And uh, we'll have dismiss after that. <laughs>